Now let's talk about sort of combining different functions. And that's gonna be a big part of this course. And um, I've been laying out the outline of this course is combining functions and seeing how do we combine functions. So we're gonna combine functions using piecewise functions or kind of gluing the pieces of different functions together. So let's say we have this machine, which is a little picky. Depending on the input, it will do something different to that input. So if x is less than 5, you just add 2. If x is greater than or equal to 5, you subtract 6. So let's look at these different workers and see what the outputs will be. So this worker has x equals 0. Think about where do we tell him to go? Do we tell him to go in the x is less than 5 bucket? Or do we tell him to go in the x is greater than or equal to 5 bucket? Well, 0 is less than 5. So he goes into the left or the less, less than 5 bucket. So we add 2 to 0. So the output is 2, 0 plus 2. Now for x is negative 2, this worker puts his input into the left bucket because negative 2 is less than 5. So we're going into the left here. That's saying add 2. So the output is 0, negative 2 plus 2. In fact, let's just write the actual operations that we're doing here. So 0 plus 2, negative 2 plus 2, and then f of 10. So we're saying the input is 10. This worker would actually put his input into the right bucket because 10 is greater than or equal to 5. So we subtract 6. So we're doing 10 minus 6 and we get the output of 4. And then for this worker, his input is negative 5. He goes in the left bucket. We add 2, so negative 5 plus 2 is negative 3. And then this next worker, he has 20. 20 is very much greater than 5. So we put it into the right bucket. So we do 20 minus 6, and we have 14. So for all of these, first before actually evaluating or doing the operation inside the machine, we had to figure out which side or which bucket does the value go into. So we first uh, needed to check which side input goes into. Does it go into the left side? Is it less than 5? Or does it go into the right side? Is it greater than or equal to 5? So remember for functions, we have that one basic rule that you'll hear all the time is each input has one and only one output. Now thinking about this function here, or this relation, I'm not saying it's a function yet, we want to think, is this machine representation of a function. I suggest you to pause and think about if there is a trouble value where it could have multiple outputs, what would that trouble value be? Now that you thought about that and maybe you looked ahead on the paper, that trouble value would most likely be 5. If we have an input of 5, where would it go? Do we put it in both of them? Is there one that we choose? Well, we would actually choose the right one because this is saying x is greater than or equal to 5. So that or equal to part is telling us that we include 5 on the right side. This left part is just saying less than 5. 5 is not less than 5, so we don't put 5 here. 5 is equal to 5, so we put it on the right side. So that is really the only potential hiccup here if this would not be a function, is that cutoff point or that splitting of the 5. So yes, this is a function. Yes, because all inputs have only one output. And we can, we'll talk about right now, about 5. And so we just said that 5 would go into the right. We would subtract by 5. 
or we subtract by six, excuse me. So let's try to get a sketch for this graph and turn this into a table. Tables are a very nice way to represent a relation or a function, and it's kind of new. We actually haven't looked at any tables uh, so far. So for this relation, we have all these different inputs. We're just starting at negative one. That's just a choice we made. We can go you know, more negative than negative one. Let's say we have negative one here. So if we put negative one into the machine, it would go on the left side. So we would add two. So this would be one because you add two to negative one, you get one. Actually, all of these over here would go on the left side. So zero would go in and you would add two. One would go in and you would add two. Two goes in, you add two, so on and so on. Just keep adding two. Now think about what would be the last value here, kind of leading us up to the water and, and seeing if we can drink from it. We have the last value would actually be five, even though five does not go on the left side. We want to see where would five be if you put it on the left side, because we can plug in four and a half. We could plug in 4.7. We can plug in 4.9, 4.99. We can get as close to five as possible because all those values are less than five, but we can't get all the way up to five. So it gets very, very close to five. So here, if we were to plug in five and put it in the left side, which it, it wouldn't go on the left side, but let's just say we did, we would get seven out here. Now for the right side, we subtract six, remember. So we start back up at five because five actually does go on the right side. And we put five in, subtract six, you get negative one, put six in, you get zero, put seven in, you get one. So we're just subtracting six on each of these. 10 minus six is four, 11 minus six is five. So now let's draw this graph. So we're starting at negative one and one. So negative one and positive one, that's a point there. Zero and two, that's a point there. One and three, that's a point there. And we just keep going two and four, that's a point, right? One, two, and then up one, two, three, four. Three and five, and four and six. However, then we get to five, and the output would be seven. So what we do, since we can get very close to five, like we can plug in 4.5, 4.9, 4.999, we can plug all those in and they would go on the left side. We get very close to five, but we don't include five. So we put a circle, an open point there. So let's connect this line. And it would keep actually going down in this pattern or in this form forever. And now for the rest, for the right side, we start back up at five and that output there is negative one. And we actually include five, so we'll start at a closed point. And then we go to six and that output is zero. And then we go to seven, that output is one. And we'll stop there even though we have these more points, but the graph is cut off there. So then we just draw our arrow. So this is what the graph of this relation, in fact, function looks like. And we organize these tables based on the different pieces, uh, based on the pieces slash conditions of the machine. That splitting point was at five on the machine. So we can actually represent these piecewise functions, not just as machines, but as equations, sort of in the language of math. So we have, we use the left side when the input is less than five, and we use the right side when input is greater than or equal to five. So the result will be, what we do to the input is we add two, so it's x plus two. And then on the other side, what we do to the input is we subtract six, so that's x minus six. So the sort of 
equation notation that we write piecewise functions as is with this kind of one big squiggly bracket and we sort of stack the pieces on top of each other. So we write the function expression. So that's like the instructions of what the machine does. And then we write the condition if, you know, x is less than five, if x is greater than or equal to five. So for this first one, we have the condition if x is less than five. And on the other one, it's if x is greater than or equal to five. I like to write the conditions first just to know what I'm writing and what the different conditions are. So for the condition of x is less than five, we just add two, x plus two. For the condition of x is greater than or equal to five, we subtract six, so we write x minus six. And that's how we write piecewise functions. So let's look at another example that's a little bit more applicable perhaps, where you are allowed to work 50 hours per week at your job, and you get time and a half for hours over 40. So if you're not familiar with time and a half or working overtime, time and a half means you get extra pay, which is sort of like 1.5 times pay. So for example, let's say, I should probably update this wage to minimum wages that are happening. Um, but let's say your base wage is $10 an hour. So if you work for $10 an hour, your time and a half would be $15 per hour. And so think about why this is gonna be a, a piecewise function, or why are we separating this in pieces? And that's because you have your normal working hours where you get $10 an hour, but then your pay changes when you get that time and a half. So let's let X be hours worked. And let's assume it's all continuous. Now a lot of times you just get sort of the cutoff discrete. You worked five hours, six hours, so on. You don't get fractions of hours. And then the output, the Y or the W of X is the total wages. So let's look at the machine here. So the cutoff point for where we get the different pays, we have to look at what is that input cutoff? Where are we splitting the input at? Well, we get regular pay up to 40 hours, and then we get that time and a half, that extra pay after 40 hours. So for the first piece, we would say X is less than, let's say less than or equal to, if we work up to 40 hours, we get our regular pay. X is less than or equal to 40. But now think about this is hours worked. So does this X go all the way down to negative? Well, no, we can't work negative hours. So this technically, would have a lower cutoff, let's fix that a little bit, a lower cutoff of zero. So x would actually be greater than or equal to zero. And I could probably put, move this up a little bit so it's easier to read, let's put it at the top. And then the other scenario, when we get the time and a half, well now x is going to be greater than 40 and when we start getting more than 40 hours, that's when we get our time and a half. However, we can't work more than 50. So X is kind of sandwiched in between 40 and 50. So let's write that in that in inequality notation. 40 is less than X, which X is less than or equal to 50. So 50 is that upper limit that we can work on our hours. So let's see what happens on our machine or on our pay for each of these different scenarios. So if we work between zero and 40 hours, pause for a moment and think, how do I write that in math? How do I write an equation for, if X is the number of hours, what would my pay be? Or what do I do to figure out my pay? Hopefully you thought about that for a moment. To figure out how much you get paid, you just multiply your wage by the number of hours that you worked. So it's nice and easy. You just we'll write it as 10 times X or just 10 X. You probably don't need to write the dollar sign, but just to keep in mind. Now let's think about for the time and a half. Now, if you are familiar with time and a half and you work overtime often, this might be just second nature to you and you sort of can just do it really quick. 
but we're sort of writing down in a more well-defined way how to figure out nicely what your pays are going to be. So now for the right side scenario, we're working overtime. We already are guaranteed working 40 hours for $10 an hour. That's a guaranteed $400 plus the overtime pay. The amount of time after 40 hours. So we want to see how much did we go over 40. So we find the difference between how many hours we worked with 40 and multiply that by our time and a half pay, which is $15. So we have $15 per hour, but it's per hour over 40. So to figure out how much over 40 we are, we take our hours worked. So we take X and subtract it from 40 because then that will give us how much we worked over 40 hours. So to write this in the equation format in the piecewise notation, let's write the conditions first. So if and if the first condition is if we work between zero and 40 hours. So zero is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to 40. And then the next condition is where we work more than 40 hours. So 40 is less than X, but X is less than or equal to 50. So for the first one, it's just nice, short and sweet, 10 X. We just work $10 an hour for X hours. And then the next one is we get that foundation of $400 plus $15 per hour for each hour over 40. So now let's take a look at different scenarios or inputs for how much we worked to how much we would get paid. The first one, if we work 25 hours, that one's just nice and easy to calculate. It's the first scenario, it's in between zero and 40. So we just multiply by 10. So 10 times 25 and we get $250. And then the next one, this is actually the overtime scenario. So we worked five hours over the 40 hours. So we're working overtime. So this one we do the foundation, $400 for that first 40 hours plus $15 per hour over the 40 hours. So we write in 45 here minus the 40 hours. Now this is going to be five. So we're doing 15 times five, which is 75. So we have 400 plus 75. So then this is 475 dollars. Then for 60 hours, the condition we set at the beginning is that our boss only allows us to work at most 50 hours per week. So we wouldn't be allowed to work for 60 hours. So this is actually undefined or does not exist. So let's fill out some of the the values and hours worked in the table. So we have, if you work zero hours where you get paid zero dollars, if you work 10 hours, 10 times 10 is $100. If you work 25 hours, you get $250. If you work 40 hours, you get $400. And then here for 40 hours, well, if we were to plug it into the second scenario, and I suggest trying to work that out, we would actually still get 400. And if we work 45 hours, we would get, we just found that to be 475. And if we work the full 50 hours, I suggest trying to, to work that out. If you plug in 50 into the second scenario, you're going to get 550 hours. And then the last one, we just gave an example of 60 hours and that does not exist. So it stops right at 50. And notice how this table is broken up and split at that 40 hour mark or that input of 40, just so we could have a nice cutoff of the different scenarios, the different conditions. So let's sketch this graph. Um, we can, we're gonna have to label this a little bit carefully. It should work here if we count by five. So let's say five, 10, I'm gonna skip a line, 20, 30, 40, 50 and 60. And if we count up, this is now going to be the outputs or the amount of money. So here this is the X and these are the Y's. And now for the Y's, we're going all the way from zero to 550. 
So this should work out well if we count by 50. So if we go 50, 100, and just for space so it doesn't get cluttered, I'll skip a line. So that's 250, then 200, or 150, then 200, 250, then 300, skip a line, 400, 500, and then 600 all at the top. So now let's plot some of these points. So 0, 0, that's at the very beginning. I'm going to change colors here, 0, 0. 10, 100. If we work 25 hours, we get paid 250. So 25 is in between here. We get 250, which is in between these ones. If we work 40 hours, we get $400. So I'm going to make this one in the blue, and then I'm going to make this one in the green. So if we work now... 40 hours, this is kind of like restarting, make an open circle sort of. At 40, we still should get 400. At 45 hours, we get 475. So we're gonna have to go between the lines. So 45 hours is right here. And then 475, that's just in between these two because this is 450 and that's 500. So right in between there. And the next one, if we work 50 hours, we get paid 550, so that's up right there. So we connect that, and then we also can connect that first part. Now it looks like this is all the same line, but this green part is actually a little bit steeper because we're getting a little bit more money. And it's kind of harder to see because we have this Y value, Y axis scaled so high, counting by 50. So now we ask, is this function continuous? Is there any holes or any breaks in the graph? And in fact, yes, it is continuous because there's no holes, there's no breaks in the domain or in the range. So what that means is the domain, let's look at the domain. If we go from left to right, we can plug in any value that we would like all the way left is starting at zero and then all the way right going to 50. We can work any amount of hours from zero to 50. So the domain here is from 0 to 50, and we use brackets because we can work 0 hours, hopefully that doesn't happen, or we can work 50 hours, hopefully that doesn't happen. And then the range of the function, how low do we go to how high do we go? The lowest we go is 0 if we work 0 hours, and the highest we go is 550 if we work 50 hours. So this is all included, so 0 to $550. So for the piecewise functions, some of these are continuous and some of these are discontinuous. And we want to see how we can tell from the graph, how we can tell from the table. So let's look at this table here. So we have this piecewise function that's broken up actually into three pieces. So what we want to do is we want to break up each of the pieces into their own individual tables. Now the goal is to have these last values, these kind of cutoff values, the actual cutoff values of the conditions. So the input cutoff here on this first one is zero. So we'll put zero there, and then we should start back up at zero there. And then the next one, the cutoff is four, and so we should put the next cutoff at four there. So it's just zero and four the cutoffs. And you wanna see which one of these are included and which one of these are not included. So on the first one it says x is less than zero. On the next one it says zero is less than or equal to x. So zero is included in the middle table, in the middle piece, but it's not included in the first piece. So let's put parentheses around the zero because it's sort of a condition on that. It's not actually included. And then for the four, 4 is included in the middle piece because it says less than or equal to, but 4 is not included in the second or in the last piece. So let's put parentheses around the 4 just to show it's not actually included there. It's sort of like a, a new restart point. So let's try to keep this a little bit shorter so we won't use the entire table. So let's just start, let's say negative 1 here and then we'll fill in some of the parts. Let's put one here as an input, three here as an input, um, and then let's just do five here as an input. So if, if negative one is the input, then we're using the first case. So you plug negative one into this first equation, 
And I suggest working these out on your own and trying to see how we got these values. But plug negative one into that, this should be negative seven. And then plug in zero into the first one, this should be negative four. And then plug in zero into the middle one. Now we're, we're moving off. So zero is actually included in the middle one. So we would have zero squared, which is zero minus four, so this should be negative four. Plug in one into this equation or into this function. We should go into the middle one because one is between zero and four. So that's one squared is one minus four is negative three. Plug in three, you get uh, nine minus four is five. Plug in four, and that's actually included in this middle one, you should get 12. Now again, I suggest pausing and working out each of those, plugging in the inputs and figuring out what the outputs are. So then for uh, going into the third piece, you plug in four. Now four technically should go in the middle, but let's just see where would the restart point be. If you plug in four, this would be 11. If you plug in five, this would be 12. So we want to think, is this continuous? And it's actually not continuous because if we look at where these cutoff or these sort of split points are, let's see, we have negative four and negative four. That's actually good. That means we stop and start at the same point here. So from here to here, there is no gap. There's no jump. It starts where it ends. But from here to here, so if we're going from the input of four to the input of four on the second and th third piece, there is a gap, there is a jump. Uh, so let's say yes, gap. So because there's a gap or there's a jump in the equations or in the outputs, that means it's not continuous. It's not continuous because gap in outputs. Between the second piece and the third piece, they do not start and stop at the same output. So for these ones, you would want to check uh, gaps at, I'm gonna put in quotes, the cutoff points or the break points. So we don't really have to fill in all the values, we just have to check these break points. So if we were to plug in five here, if we were to plug in five here, the output would be seven. If we were to plug in five here, the output would be negative one. So this one's not continuous because there's a gap in those break points. The outputs of the, of the break point, which is five, is not the same. And here, we would check at 40. If you plug in 40, you get 400. If you plug in 40 here, you actually get 400 also. So you plug in the gap or the, the, the break point, the cutoff point, which is 40, and you get the same thing. So yes, that is continuous, but these other ones are not continuous because they don't start and stop at the same points. Now, an added piece is talking about how to graph or how to put piecewise functions in your calculators. So there's two kind of Desmos calculators. There's the Desmos Scientific, and then there's the Desmos Graphing. So the one I've been using so far is the Desmos Scientific. But Desmos also has a graphing calculator, which can be really nice. So if we're using the Desmos Graphing Calculator, we can put in piecewise equations, piecewise functions, but we have to know how to put them in. So let's say y is equal to, let's do the 50, or let's just do 5x minus 2. And then if we want to put a condition on this, we use the squiggly brackets. So we go to ABC, we put the squiggly bracket in, and we say, uh, x has to be less than, uh, let's say, 1. So it cuts off right there. And then if you want to do another piece, we say y is equal to, now let's do 
negative 2x plus 3. And we say a condition, let's restart back at 1, and we'll say x has to be greater than or equal to 1. Now notice here, it doesn't use the open or closed dots, so you have to do that interpretation on your own. There would be, I think I can zoom in here, make it easier to see. There would be a open dot here, because it's just less than one, and there would be a closed dot here. And because there's a gap here, this is not a continuous function. This would be discontinuous.